Just because we speak English language, it does not mean that we understand Western culture. In fact, that's one of the strongest claims I want to make. We do not understand Western culture. We simply do not. What is even worse is, here comes the bite. Nevertheless, because we use this language, I don't mean by that English as a language, I mean a certain way of talking about the word, and we think it, we make it into our own, it begins to act as a filter between yourself and your experience of the world. You can't access it anymore. You are not troubled by the following simple fact that you cannot go on the road and ask someone what is his religion in your own vernaculars. You cannot ask it in Hindi, you cannot ask it in Bengali, you cannot ask it in Tamil, you cannot ask it in Kannada. But you have no problem as soon as you meet someone in English test, ask, are you religious? What religion are you? We forget the next second when you go out, we can't ask this question. Why? You cannot say we have religion but we don't have words for it. Because if we had religion, we would have also had discourses about religion. That means we would have discovered concepts. We would have formulated, we would have found out words, we would have created new words. But we don't have them. Jeffrey today was mentioning something funny in 1921 about people responding to uh, answers to questions as Hindu. So Jeffrey, I'd like to share with you my own experience. I was hardly 12 years old. I had to enter the high school and had to fill up the application form. And there was always a column where you have to mention your religion. And there were fi five options. Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, other. Five categories. I was 12 years old. I got this. First, first time I was filled up the application form, I didn't understand the question. So I went to my father, who was a double graduate, just to tell you that, I mean, he was not illiterate. So I asked him, what should I answer? He said, right, not applicable. So I wrote, not applicable. I went to the class, and it's not just my experience. Of many, many, many people I know. I almost know no exception from my age group. So I went to the classroom. He was a Muslim teacher. He looked at it, and he said, what are you? Why have you said not, not applicable? Sir, I, I don't know. I'm a Sanketi, I said. Sanketi is the language I speak at home. So that you are a Hindu. No, sir, I'm not a Hindu. I'm a Sanketi. Because I didn't know what Hindu meant. I thought it was some jati or something. So he said, then he began, are you a Christian? No, sir. Are you a Muslim? No, sir. Are you a Buddhist? No, sir. Then you're a Hindu? No, sir. Are you something else? No, sir. I'm a Sanketi. No, that's not true. Are you a Hindu? No, sir. He gets hat, hit on that. Right Hindu there? No, sir. One more. Right Hindu there? Immediately wrote Hindu. <laughs> Second year, Muslim teacher had gone. New teacher, so I thought I'd try it again. But still hadn't figured out. I was 13 or 12, 13. Still hadn't figured out. Did the same thing? Got beaten up again. So since then, anybody asked me what is your religion, I said, I'm a Hindu. You see, this, today, of course, my, my nieces tell me a different story. They say they feel like Hindus. I don't know what the hell it means. I am not, in that sense, a Hindu, and most of the Indians are not Hindus. We don't know what it means. It is not a part of our experience. So to speak, therefore, and that is why, for example, in, 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 in textbooks, who is a Hindu? It's very difficult to say what Hinduism is. Anybody who recognizes himself is a Hindu. And therefore, anybody who is a Hindu belongs to Hinduism. Hinduism is everything and Hindus call Hinduism. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Definitional problem solved. So to come back, we have taken our way of talking about the world, which does not make sense to us, which doesn't allow us to access our own experience. This was the case with the Western elites of yesterday, and then Indian elites of today, we just are taking over our language and reproducing nonsense to us because it doesn't make sense of our experience. It is worse than that. It, pre it prevents access to our experiences, which means two things happen. One is we continuously deceive ourselves, which is the reason why intellectuals after independence have had no impact on Indian society. Don't expect them to have any impact either. Because they are not talking about India. And that's not simply with respect to Hinduism. It respects any number of other things that the Europe, Europe told about us. So their experience of the world, we have taken to be truths about India. It's not. It is their experience of the world. And that tells us a lot about their culture. Which is what we need to understand as well. But notice a second thing. If they don't make sense to us, we take it, we use it and in the process of using also add other things, what we'll fundamentally be doing is 
is to deform the theological languages we take over. <coughs> so that when the Indians do theology, they basically most of the time, in non, when they do non unconscious theology, <coughs> they basically end up distorting. And that has been the biggest problem missionaries faced. You see, they, if they found, look, Indians have no problem in accepting a story about Christ. They go and just simply add Christ to their pantheon. I mean, the missionaries tore their hairs out of frustration. I don't know how many of them went bald because of that. And I'm very serious. They, it was one of the biggest problems they had. They could not get across the idea to the Indians. I don't mean by that the peasant, but I mean by that also to the intellectuals. So in this process, what happens is deformation. But what kind of deformation? Interestingly enough, you find it even within contributions to Christian theology coming from Indian writers, Indian Christians. Let me pick out one random example because I just passed it through Oxford University Press and I thought about that. Some, 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 some priest somewhere in India, in India, uh, wrote a book recently published by Oxford University Press about Christ and the drum. He comes from one of the tribes which uses drums to communicate messages, obviously. And of course, with this liberation theology, you are always, you always belong to the oppressed. And then you are quoted by United States and Europe, right? I mean, if you are a Dalit, you are fested and you are taken around and so on. If you are a Brahmin, you are not. So today it's, very good, it's a very good thing to be a Dalit and all Indians know that. So I suppose one of the Dalits, Christ is the drum. And drum is the Christ. Well, if, if I belong, and this guy got his PhD in Harvard Divinity College. Well, if I was a professor in Harvard Divinity and I read such things as Christ is the drum, the drum is the Christ. Well, I say, well, you know, Indians are no threat to me, you know. The light is behind me. I mean, they don't even understand well, who Christ is, what Christ is. And of course, what's the problem? Give him a PhD, send him here, he'll forever continue American way of life here. 